on this Sunday night, the start of a holy month marred by violence and despair. <laughs> Ramadan begins with mounting fears in Gaza of an Israeli ground offensive. <laughs> as logistical aid challenges leave millions in dire need and at risk of starvation. Canada's winter wallop. We will see significant snowfall, uh, which is driving the avalanche hazard. Snow and rain ravage regions from BC to Quebec with more storms on the way. Remembering sacrifice and renewing bonds. Canada honors 10 years since its Afghanistan combat missions end and the persisting ties. From the sugar shack to the red carpet, the Canadian sweetness to be savored at the Oscars tonight. Global National with Farah Nasser, reporting tonight, Neetu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There are renewed fears of an imminent Israeli ground offensive in Rafah tonight as Ramadan begins. With no sign of a ceasefire in Gaza, Israelis and Palestinians are bracing for what could be a violent holy month ahead. Tonight, Palestinians in Gaza are preparing to mark Ramadan under the shadow of war and the backdrop of religious sites in ruins. And tensions are reverberating into the West Bank. In Jerusalem's old city, tens of thousands are expected expected to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a site that has long been a flashpoint between Israelis and Palestinians. Israel has limited access to the mosque since the Hamas attack on October 7th and is warning of further restrictions on worshippers. The United Nations says more than half a million Palestinians in Gaza are on the brink of famine. And with humanitarian aid slow to reach people, there is so much desperation during a time meant for prayer, peace and reflection. Redmond Shannon has our top story tonight. At a market in Rafah, there is some food available in the lead up to Ramadan, but not much. Look around, says this man. No one can afford to buy anything. He is among the hundreds of thousands of displaced people living in tents in Gaza's most southern city. Most adults will be fasting during daylight hours starting Monday. However, scarce food is in Rafah. In northern Gaza, the situation is even worse. The United Nations says airdrops are doing nowhere near enough to ease the food crisis. Hamas says at least 20 people have died of starvation. At a port in Cyprus, a Spanish aid ship was supposed to have left for Gaza this weekend. It remained in port Sunday night, but is expected to leave in the coming hours. Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie is on a visit to Israel. She says she wants Canada to be part of the coalition supporting the new maritime corridor. One of the NGO workers involved posted this video claiming it shows a jetty being built in Gaza. It's unclear if it's the same site as a U.S. proposed temporary port. A U.S. ship has now left Virginia with equipment for that project. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant inspected preparations for the sea corridor on Sunday, but cooperation between Israel and the U.S. remains far from straightforward. I, in my view, is hurting Israel more than helping Israel. U.S. President Joe Biden talking about Benjamin Netanyahu's war strategy. The Israeli leader was quick to respond. I don't know exactly what the president meant. But if he meant by that that I'm pursuing private policies against the majority, the wish of the majority of Israelis, and that this is uh, hurting the interests of Israel, then he's wrong on both counts. The goal of peace before Ramadan has now been missed. Israel and Hamas continue to blame each other for the lack of any ceasefire agreement. Nitu? Redmond Shannon in London tonight. Thanks, Redmond. Turning to the chaos and state of emergency in Haiti now, last night Washington sent in U.S. Marines airlifting non-essential embassy staff out of Haiti as violence engulfs the Caribbean country. Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, Bob Ray, will join Caribbean leaders in Jamaica for emergency talks on the escalating unrest tomorrow. Washington's pre-dawn operation in Haiti's capital appears to have been carried out by helicopter. Criminal gangs have effectively taken control of Haiti and have overrun the capital Port-au-Prince, attacking the airport, police stations, prisons and government buildings this week. 
The violence stems from attempts to overthrow the Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, who assumed power with U.S. support in 2021, but has not held an election. Global Affairs Canada says there are more than 2,900 Canadians registered as being in Haiti. Global Affairs also says the government is not planning any departure assistance or repatriation flights for Canadians in Haiti, but that it continues to monitor the situation closely. There is havoc in Indonesia tonight. Days of torrential rain has triggered flash flooding and landslides, killing at least 19 people. More than 70,000 people have been evacuated out of the province of West Sumatra, with at least seven others still missing. Nearly 700 homes, as well as several schools, bridges, and 280 acres of farmland have been damaged. Officials are warning there could be further damage, with more rain expected in the days ahead. Here at home, much of Canada remains within winter's grip, despite most of the country springing forward for daylight saving time. Snow and rain has been slamming parts of British Columbia, Quebec and along the East Coast this weekend. As Heather Urex West explains, there's still more wet, windy weather on the way. Fredericton, New Brunswick was hit with heavy rain Sunday, with 45 millimeters expected to fall. A day after Newfoundland was hit with a blast of late winter snow. In parts of Newfoundland, including St. John's, digging out with up to 50 centimetres of snow falling over the past two days. There is a brief break between systems. That'll be on Monday, but the winds will still pick up with gusts of up to 50 kilometres per hour. And for Monday night, we could see another round of snow. There was heavy snowfall across much of Quebec this weekend too, as much as 35 centimetres in places, knocking out power to more than 120,000 homes. Right now we have 215 teams spread across the most affected regions. Some secondary roads are hard to access and our teams have to go and clear some bro broken branches uh, under the heavy snow. In Western Canada, an influx of rain and snow raising fears there could be snow slides. A special public avalanche warning remained in effect for the weekend for Banff, Yoho and Kootenai National Parks, as well as Alberta's Kananaskis country. But the avalanche danger is highest right now on Vancouver Island, the Lower Mainland, as well as in northern BC, where an avalanche claimed the life of a snowmobiler earlier this year. This is due to the incoming weather, so we are expecting a significant amount of precip and wind. Below the snow rain line, the precip will likely fall as rain, but above that we will see significant snowfall, uh, which is driving the avalanche hazard. Backcountry users being urged to check bulletins carefully. The final weeks of winter, on the calendar at least, packing a powerful punch. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. A ceremony was held at the National War Memorial in Ottawa this morning to mark the 10th anniversary of the end of Canada's combat mission in Afghanistan. More than 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members served during the 13-year mission and 158 of them died in the conflict. As David Aiken reports, though the combat mission has long been over, Canada remains very much connected to the troubled country. It was Canada's longest war. Canadian men and women fighting and some dying from 2001 until 2014. Our Afghanistan experience has left none untouched. Many, including families, are starred physically, mentally, and morally from it. Wayne Eyre is now Canada's top general, but he was a commander in the Afghanistan capital of Kabul on the day Canada's fighting there ended. Many of us have asked and have been asking, what is it worth it? And the answer to that question is deeply personal. I think it was very definitely worth it. Um, I noticed um, my two tours, the, the difference. What happened in Afghanistan in recent years doesn't change the nature of my service or my time or my experiences or those of my friends in Afghanistan. We were there, as, as General Air said, we were doing exactly what the country asked us to do. Canada's fighting ended in 2014, but conflict in the country did not. Our members served with valor and selflessness. They were there to make a difference, and they did. Canada moved to providing Afghan governments with aid and advice. But since the Taliban takeover of the country in 2021, 
Canada has been trying to take in refugees. Amadala Yakubi was a civil servant forced to leave Afghanistan three years ago. I don't have choice because Afghanistan for me was very difficult. He had not seen his wife and two daughters since then, until their reunion last week in Calgary. They were part of a group of 300 new Afghan refugees. In Afghanistan, uh, daughter don't go to the school, don't go now. My daughter coming here, go to school. My daughter, my family here is free, can go every place. But I'm very happy for that. There are those who believe Canada can do more. There are Afghans, for example, who have had to flee the Taliban. They're in neighboring countries like Pakistan, hoping to get their chance to start a new life here in Canada. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. In Oakville, Ontario, a long-standing monument at a private cemetery has been removed after much controversy over who it was honoring. The memorial was dedicated to a division of Ukrainian soldiers during the Second World War. But as Kayla McLean reports, those troops were part of a Nazi military unit. In this Oakville cemetery, a monument once stood honoring World War II veterans. Under any other circumstance, it would never be questioned. But this monument honored soldiers that served on the wrong side of history. To the Jewish people, this monument represents a horrible past. It connects us to the Holocaust. The monument is dedicated to the 14th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, a Nazi military unit made up of predominantly Ukrainian soldiers who fought with the Germans against the Soviet Union. The plot purchased by veterans of the division and erected in 1988. They would have sworn allegiance to Adolf Hitler and to the SS, and they would have participated um, consciously in actions that would have helped to facilitate uh, the Holocaust. Efforts to have the monument removed gained steam nearly six months ago when Yaroslav Hunka, veteran who served in the same division, received a standing ovation in the House of Commons, provoking international outrage. In the fall after the Hunka affair, we saw a group of local neo-Nazis make a pilgrimage to this uh, monument, which was deeply distressing. But today, that pilgrimage site is gone. After years of lobbying and discussions held by Jewish organizations, the cemetery board and local Ukrainian representatives, the decision was made to take the cenotaph down. And now, nothing but the platform and this sign remains. The cemetery's board says the sign will be removed Monday. Richard Robertson at Benai Brith Canada, who participated in the talk, says the work has only just begun. It's incumbent that the removal of this monument be used as an example to further spurn our government to continue to release information to the public about Canada's Nazi past so that we can learn from it. This cenotaph didn't stand alone. There are other similar monuments to the SS unit that remain up in Edmonton. Monuments now whose days may also be numbered. Kayla McLean, Global News. Nova Scotia's coastal controversy coming up. Why a shift in the province's protection plan is stirring skepticism. A recent reversal in Nova Scotia's strategy to address coastal erosion is generating plenty of criticism. As experts project the greatest rates of relative sea level rise will be along the Atlantic coast, some are questioning the provincial government's change of direction. Heidi Petrochik explains what they say is at stake. The seawall built at a small public beach on Nova Scotia's south shore has become a symbol of the struggle between private development and coastal protection. We're very afraid of losing access, for one thing. At high tide, the beach now disappears. Residents also worry the construction is damaging the dunes and the saltwater marsh behind. If the Coastal Protection Act had been in place, uh, that wall would probably not have been built. That act passed in 2019 under the Liberals, but was never proclaimed. So now the PC government has parked it, putting the responsibility for coastal development on municipalities and citizens instead. It's very complicated for us at a provincial level to put in a, a set of regulations that deal with all of those various circumstances. The province has created an online map to show coastal areas at risk. Experts say government isn't thinking long term. When I've put in properties, there are some now, for example, that are not yet coastal properties, but will be by 2100. What are those homeowners supposed to do? With at least 4.8 million Canadians living within 10 kilometers of the coastline, this is a very real issue for a lot of people, and nature isn't taking its time. 
the coastal erosion processes in Atlantic Canada are particularly uh, accelerating because of the, the lack of sea ice, as well as kind of increased storm surge and potential for hurricanes. Acom says Nova Scotia's strategy misses the mark. While Prince Edward Island, on the other hand, has a moratorium on most new coastal construction as it works out its own rules. We need to be more thinking about re retrieving or kind of retreating some of those properties at risk. Back at Nova Scotia's Little Crescent Beach. It's a middle finger to the people that live in this province. Harsh words for the province's decision have government between a rock and a hard place. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, near West Dublin, Nova Scotia. Ahead, the warnings from experts as warm weather welcomes an early tick season. Spring is fast approaching and with the change in season comes the risk of ticks and the disease they carry. And a mild winter means the arachnids may have gotten a bit of a jump in terms of reproduction and are already lurking in places you may not expect. Tonight, Catherine Ward looks at what you need to know. You can't just wait till the spring feels like spring with crocuses to worry about ticks. As people embrace this year's unseasonably warm weather, associate biology professor David Beresford says it's crucial to remember ticks are also part of the package deal. They only need about four degrees Celsius and they're active and they're questing. They want to grab on and they want to bite. This year, the National Veterinary Association says it is even more concerned than usual, saying recent research has shown that ticks infected with tick-borne pathogens may actually be more resilient than uninfected ticks, adding these fitter, better, faster, stronger ticks can increase the risk for people and pets across our country. Veterinarian Dr. Maggie brown Burry explains. They are the first ones to kind of come to life when we hit that temperature that they need. And so they're the ones that are most likely going to be biting you. And that means increased risk of disease transmission. In Canada, the ones to watch for are black-legged ticks, also known as deer ticks. The tick will get onto you and you won't feel anything. And they're really good at being sneaky. And then they'll insert their mouth parts into you. They'll sort of cement them in. Health Canada says a tick has to be attached for at least 24 hours in order to transmit the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Experts say checking yourself after being outside is an easy and effective defense. We need to get outside too. Um, and it, it's not that hard to inspect. Just be aware of it. Remember, do it. It's, it's a 10 minute operation. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Next, turning syrupy setbacks into success. How a New Brunswick business is tapping into the season's early sap flow. I don't know if we can be trusted with such a weapon, but I know the Nazis can't. Hollywood is gearing up for this year's Academy Awards tonight with Christopher Nolan's historic epic Oppenheimer heavily favored to take the top Oscars, including Best Picture. Plenty of Canadian talent will also be in the spotlight. That includes Celine Song and her acclaimed debut film Past Lives, nominated for Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. And Ryan Gosling up for Best Supporting Actor for his show-stealing performance in Barbie. Win or lose, Oscar hopefuls will be able to enjoy a Canadian treat for their taste buds afterwards. Sagar, a luxury suite from Quebec, will be part of the very expensive gift bags being given to the stars at tonight's ceremony. The treat is made from fluffy sugar from maple sap and is said to be worth $1,300. There is plenty of maple sap to go around for some businesses in New Brunswick, but due to bad weather conditions, last season was not ideal for our prize syrup makers. But now, as Anna Mandon tells us, an early start to the sap flow is already sweetening production. Dumfries Maples collects and prepares its own maple sap, which is turned into products like syrup and maple butter. This year, the sap flowed early. Still hopeful that, you know, it may just work out to be a uh an average season or maybe a little better, we'll wait and see. And They've started producing syrup a week ahead from last year. They're not the only ones. It is definitely an early season. Uh, late season, we don't get maple sap until the end of March or early April. This year's early start means Little Mac to Quack Maples can run tours during March break. It's nice to 
be able to get everybody out and get started early in the season. But both producers were very clear. An early start does not mean a good season. We can't make predictions until it's over because really uh, we, we have no control over the weather and that's really what what does it for us. Last year was a bad season for maple syrup. Scott says their production was down about 30 percent. You don't like to have have too many too many of those in a row because you do have to make product. For the sap to keep flowing, producers need consistent freezing overnight and warm temperatures during the day. That gets the sap from the tree to processing equipment and onto pancakes. Cheryl Jones just had some of the Dumfries maple syrup. I had it for brunch. It was delicious. The season will end around mid-April to May. Producers will know then whether it was a good year for maple syrup. Anna Mandon, Global News, Dumfries, New Brunswick. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. We leave you tonight in the Middle East, where officials have seen the crescent moon that marks the start of Ramadan for much of the world. Roughly 1.8 billion Muslims observe the holy month every year. It holds extra meaning this year in the wake of Israel's war on Hamas in Gaza. Thanks so much for watching, and Donna will be back with you tomorrow. Have a great night.